Welcome to the Dog Storytime Podcast. If you'd like to hear the amazing stories of the dogs in our lives, this is the show for you. From the heartwarming to the head tilting, we share the stories of dog owners and their furry family members. And now your host, luxury fine art pet photographer and puppy whisperer, Kimberly Sarah Bucari. Hey everyone, this is Kimberly Sarah Bucari and welcome to the Dog Storytime Podcast. Our guest today is Helen St. Pierre. Helen is known locally as an amazing dog trainer who runs the fabulous No Monkey Business Dog Training. She's out of Concord, New Hampshire. And today she's going to tell us all about her first dog, Merlin, and all the things she did wrong and right that made her a better dog trainer. Here we go. Helen, thank you for being on the podcast today. Um, For those who are interested, today is... Um, let's see, the middle of the coronavirus, um, the 8th, right, of April. Uh, so we are recording this from our home, so please um, disregard any dog barking. Helen, how many pups do you have there today? I have seven dogs here today. Seven dogs, okay, and it's very quiet there. I have one and it's a bit noisy today. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. who's the dog trainer? Helen, what's the story you want to tell us today? I was going to talk a little bit about my very first dog uh, named Merlin that I learned how to be a dog trainer with. Wonderful. Let's hear. So what type of dog was Merlin? So Merlin was a Papillon. He um, was, I was in college and I had started dog training when I was in high school uh, because what I did for extra money, I actually um, loved to paint and I was an artist and I would paint Mm -hmm. people's pet portraits for extra cash. And, um, I didn't have a dog of my own, but I would go to the library. I would read books on dog training and I would teach these dogs to sit and stay so I could paint them, Uh um, or sketch them and then paint them. I mean, this was before we had iPhones that would take pictures that quickly. Like I had to buy all these instant cameras that you would then like take in and they would give you And then you'd have to develop and then you're waiting two weeks to get it back. So I had to teach dogs how to pose for a little bit so I could do some sketching and some gestural work. And um, I ended up going to college at Syracuse University Mm -hmm. and I was studying for bachelors of fine arts. But what was really cool about Syracuse was that you could take electives, um, the academic electives in all the other schools. So that was really neat because I was able to then say, wow, I'm really interested in animals and dogs. And I started taking classes in behavior and um, very quickly, about halfway through my my college career, I realized I really want to work with animals. I want to work with dogs. So I decided to go get a dog. And um, I I looked at rescues. Nobody would give me a dog. I was in college. I didn't own a home. I had no yard. Right. Um, That was like I was turned down every place I went. So I started looking into breeders. And again, this is this was I don't know. God, two thousand three before the internet was like big. Big. Okay. There was no pet finder at this point. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Um, But there was a website called Puppy Find. It's still out there today, where you would take a little quiz to see what dogs you were interested in. And of course I wrote, I want a dog that's very easily trained. I want a dog that's small because I was in college and I didn't want a big dog. And I will never forget the image of a papillon that came up. It said, a papillon sounds like a great fit for you. And I just, the, it was like instant that I was like, this is a dog for me. Um, so then I started the research of New York, upstate New York breeders. And I came across a breeder, um, that I'm still in connection with today. I've, I've always, I will always have one of her papillons. As long as she breeds, there will always be one of her breeds at one of her pups in my house. Um, so I contacted her and I literally grilled her on the phone for about two hours. And she said, um, I said, well, okay, so when can I get the puppy? She said, well, can I ask you some questions now? (laughs) And I said, sure. And, um, she had a male puppy available and from a litter and I went up to go visit and this little male puppy came and sat on my lap and I'd never had a dog before. You have to, um, understand I was, did not grow up with dogs and this Merlin and I were love at first sight. Right. Oh my goodness. Um, so Merlin was a papillon and, um, I raised him for the first, you know, year in, in college. And, uh, of course I, you know, I was 
trying out all these things that I'd read and I'd done all these things and I did everything wrong with him. But I also <laughs> learned a lot about how to be the do- how to be the dog trainer that I am today. So I took him for the first time to a class. Um, I, I knew I wanted to take an obedience class. I took him to a class and when I entered the class, they handed me a choke chain. Oh gosh. I have this tiny little choke chain for this tiny, tiny puppy. I mean, a papillon puppy, right. if you've never seen it, it's like a freaking guinea pig. <laughs> and uh, they're, they more, have, they're more, they are more fur than anything oh, else. Oh yeah, I mean, yeah, they, exactly. Yeah. With ears, oh, these massive yes. ears. <laughs> yes. And they gave me this choke chain and I thought, okay, well, I don't know enough, so I'll put this on him. Yeah. And he yeah. was jumping up at me and trying to get my attention because of course I had treats. And the instructor said, well, when he does that, you need to pull up on that choke chain, you need to step on his back feet. Uh, and wow. I just, I couldn't do it. I was like, that can't be, this can't be. The only way. Right. So I kind of scooped him up and I said, I really don't feel very well. I think we'll go home. We'll see you next week. We left. We never went back. Never went back. (laughs) Exactly. Um, And I started reading books on uh, small dog training and I started training Merlin and Merlin became this incredible um, trick dog. Uh, He would do everything, anything and everything. He would weave in and out of my legs. He would retrieve things. I mean, he was a superstar in that way. So I did a lot of things wrong, but I then ended up doing a lot of things right. And there are a couple of really funny Merlin stories. Um, and I'll tell you my favorite one because it's, it's the one that was the most humbling. So, you know, Merlin, I think was about two or three at this time. I'd graduated college. We had moved out to Colorado, um, where I ended up continuing my dog training career and working at shelters for the first time, which is Mm -hmm. why I ended up being so passionate about my shelter work. Well, the, the town that we lived in was having a pet days. And um, I was really starting to think that I, I could do dog training for a career now. Like, this is what I want to do. Right. So I, um, they had a tricks contest set up for the, uh, for the day. And I said, I'm, oh, my God, I'm going to put Merlin and I in this. And we're just going to blow everybody away with his tricks. He's just going to do the best thing ever. So we went and we enrolled and people went up and, you know, some dogs did their bows and some dogs did spins and all that. And I'm just standing on the edge of the line going, oh my God, we're going to blow everybody away. And of course I've been treating Merlin throughout the morning just for keeping him with me and that kind of Mm -hmm. stuff with hot dogs. Oh boy. So finally they call our name. I go into the middle of the ring with Merlin and they say, you know, can you announce yourself? I'm like, my name is Helen Nichols and I am a professional dog trainer and this is my dog Merlin and we're going to show some tricks. (laughs) Well, Merlin's standing there with me and the guy goes, all right, you know, take it away. There's a huge crowd around us. Sure. And I cue Merlin to sit and he looks at me and I'm like, Merlin, sit. And he looks at me and I kid you not, Kim, he squatted and took the biggest poop in the middle of the, yes, in the (laughs) middle of the ring. And it wasn't just a normal poop. Yeah, like we're talking about like hot dogs, hot dogs greasy, all morning. Oily, couldn't, yes. couldn't pick it up with a bag yes, elegantly. Right. right. And then, Did you say ta-da right, at the end of it? Well, of course I was too humiliated to make any jokes at this point, you know? So I, I try, I'm trying to pick it up and he then decides, oh, I feel so much better. I'm going to have zoomies and I'm going oh, to stop. run around you like oh, oh my full goodness. tail out running around. Oh my goodness. And it was so awful, but it was so wonderful because it was one of the most humbling moments for me. That's exactly. (laughs) And so now, you know, when people come into my classes and they say, I've had the worst week, I'm like, I know, I get it. I, I wanted, I, and I scooped him up and I was like bright red. I wanted to cry, you know, but he had no freaking concept. And that was one of my, that's one of my favorite things, stories to tell people. It's like, yes. Dogs have no idea about these stupid things that our, us humans want them to do. Right, they just exactly. live in and, the moment. And, well, that's it too. And they don't care. They are not in this world for um, to make themselves look good. They're not right. in this world to you know get acclimates. They're not. They're just not. <laughs> I know. So what is so important to us in that moment? It really doesn't matter. They ground us so much. <laughs> I know. And it was, it was great because I can, it's, it's one of my favorite stories. He was, you know, and it was just one of those moments where I'm like, wow, he's still a dog. Like they're still going to have those moments where they are absolutely terrible. Yes. Um, Yes. But they're not being terrible. They're just being dogs. Right. Exactly. Exactly. It was a great teaching moment. Really great teaching moment for me. 
Yeah, you that's know? fantastic. That's fantastic. <laughs> so did you go on to do more tricks at another time? Not, not that no. day. I think I, I pretty much went and like got in a fetal position for a couple <laughs> right. of days and didn't come out of the, the room. Reassessed your whole life yes, at this point, yes. right? <laughs> like thought about every bad choice I'd ever yes. made and definitely didn't do hot dogs with Merlin again. But, yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. I mean, um, <laughs> we went we went on and Merlin went on to do all kinds of fun stuff. He was a great dog who he we did school shows and we did all of this. I mean, he was my partner for 15 years, but he taught me, I mean, the trainer I am today wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been for Merlin and I and those mistakes that I made, you know, right. exactly. all those little moments exactly. along the way. So Helen, would you say your first experience with the training where they gave you the choke collar, um, if it doesn't feel right to you, then it's probably not right. I mean, you have this, this instinct that this small dog did not need this type of reprimand um, that they were telling you to do. Does that sound right to you, that if it doesn't feel right, then it probably isn't? I think there's a difference between knowing this doesn't feel right or I don't know enough about this. So okay. I think that, you know, I have some people that come in for training that don't, they've never done this kind of training before. They've never tried this kind of training before. And there's a feeling of either doubt or uncertainty. And there has to be the ability for anybody when they're doing training like that to, to feel comfortable asking why. And I'm more than happy when my clients say, well, why are we doing it this way? Sure. For me to be able to break that down and answer it for them. Um, but the feeling that I had in that environment wasn't necessarily that um, it wasn't, a, it, I didn't feel like I could have said why it was presented okay. to me in a, such a way that it was like, this is what we're doing and there is no other way. Okay. And that I think is one of the biggest problems. I think for a lot of people that seek a dog trainer out that has a one size fits all and they feel that they can't ask why, or they can't educate themselves on something different because the trainer is not willing to bend at all. Right. Right. Okay. So how do you recommend, and we'll get into how you train as well, but how do you recommend people find the right person, the right trainer for, for them and their dog? Well, what's really cool now is that there are a lot of organizations, um, we're working with legislation now to um, really start standardizing the profession of dog training because dog training is not a standardized profession. Anybody okay. can be a dog trainer. There's no licensing program. There's oh, nothing like that. Interesting. Um, which is a serious problem. Not Honestly, it's not necessarily for the trainers. It's not a problem, but it's a real right. problem for the people that are looking for advice because, I mean, you need a license to like fish or hunt. You need a license to uh, ride a motorcycle. You, to, yes. You, yes. you don't need a license to work with animals that are going to be living in people's homes. Exactly. Right. Right. So there's a lot of legislation that we're trying to push. And what, what I go with is I go with, um, when I'm recommending clients to somebody not that's not local to me or that I, they're, they're away from me, they're in, you know, I got a call from someone in Iowa, they need a trainer. I go to those certification boards that I know are international, that I know have rigorous standards and continue education requirements. And I look up those trainers and send them to people. Um, not only do I know that those, those trainers have gone through specific um, certification requirements, but I also know that in order to maintain those certifications, they have to have continuing education units every single year. Oh, and so that tells right. me that they're progressive right. and they may not have the exact same methodologies that I have. Every mm -hmm. dog trainer is different, but mm -hmm. I know that they're, they're not doing the same thing that they did 30 years ago. Right. They're staying current. They're still learning. Exactly. They're, yes. Okay, great. That's wonderful. So Helen, let's talk about your training what what is it that you do for folks that don't know? Um, Helen it runs No Monkey Business Dog Training, and she is out of Concord, New Hampshire. Um, but she is very well known in this area and beyond. Um, so, Helen, explain to us what is it that you do? I train humans. Mm -hmm. I teach humans how. Right. I teach humans how to train their dogs and. My niche has really been in um, family dog or real world dog training. I have worked with police canines. My husband was a canine handler. We've lived with canines. Um, I've I've seen that kind of training. I've um, I love agility and sport dog training, but yes. it's not what I have found 
is the most needed for people living with their dogs. So sure. my, my big thing is teaching humans how to have their dog be well-loved, um, well-trained members of the family. Yes. Um, and kind of debunking a lot of these, quite frankly, really unfair myths for people like if, well, I can't let my dog up on the couch with me because, and it's just like, well, then why do we have our dogs? I mean, I, you know, and people will say, well, I know I'm not supposed to do this. And I'm like, who told you that? that? Yeah. Right. Like, you know, I'm sitting on the couch with like four dogs next to me and I give them my table scraps and all that stuff and really showing people that there's a balance and you can do all these things that you love to do with your dog, but you can balance it out with training and it doesn't have to be permissive. You can right. still train and have fun and not end up with a dog that's walking all over you. Yes. Yes. You know, Excellent. so that's, that's the main thing. And then a lot of aggression, a lot of reactivity, um, you know, that kind of stuff. It's, it's all based on family dogs and okay, dogs that live so with you, us every day. So you do, um, that type of work where you have an assessment of a dog and you kind of figure out a, a training plan. Is it individual for aggressive dogs or dogs that need a, a bit more? Yeah. Uh, I mean, style? yep. It's dependent on what I do. So I have classes, group classes, mm -hmm. and which is kind of like a, it's a curriculum. It's a sequential class. You come and you learn things. And then I also do the one-on-ones for dogs that maybe need a little bit more of a specifically tailored training plan, you know, or they, they won't fit in a group setting just yet because okay. they have issues with people or dogs or they're very fearful or, I mean, it's, again, it's no one size fits all. It's usually, um, everything is very, very flexible. I've had people that they have severely aggressive dogs towards people and dogs. We work on uh, one on ones and then they move in. They're eventually able to move into classes. And then I've had oh, people wonderful. that have done classes and then move into one on ones. I mean, it's, it's completely flexible based on what the dog needs. Excellent. Excellent. That that's great. I mean, so people know that there is help out there. Um, for their dogs that, again, either can't integrate into the family or they're noticing some aggression or behaviors that they rather not have their dogs do. Yeah, that well, they need they, to yeah, modify. Exactly, right. Yeah. Exactly. And I mean, Wonderful. sometimes it's it's just boils down to even in just a one on one session, just understanding the dog better. Yes. Um, and, and that can be all that's needed is, you know, people will say, well, my dog's doing this. And then we pull back and we sit down and we talk about what's called the antecedents, you know, what's happening mm -hmm. before these behaviors are happening mm -hmm. and how do we modify those? And that's all that's needed, you know, but people have this idea that if their dog does something like that, that they are in need of this, you know, massive therapeutic behavior change. And sometimes right. it's, it's really very simple. It's as simple as just switching the antecedent, understanding your dog a little bit better. Well, and that's that, that. Yeah. And that, that is truly the key, right? I mean, you're helping us as humans to understand the dog. And I know that when I did training with Winston and I've learned to read, um, again, some of the things and antecedents that set him off, we we had a better life together. You know what I mean? Like, right. like it really, we really jived. And now Winston, of course, is a cardigan corgi, so he barks all the time at anything. Um, but <laughs> but there's there's a minimum, and there's there's things that I can I can see his little brain working through before he builds up to that bark, and I either remove him from that place or you know. Change right, and I mean, that can, we can change. Yeah, Kim, you said it completely right. You're like, he's a corgi, so I know he's going to bark. And right. sometimes, sometimes, honestly, that's what people need. They just need permission to go. Okay, this is normal for my dog. Yeah, you know, I mean, yes. it's the same thing as me going. You know, my two year old is just having tantrums all the time, and right. people, if it's like another mother going, how long? That's because she's two. It's, it's okay, two. Yeah. right? And it, it's right. like, oh, thank God, it gives you permission. Yes, for your dog to be that way, exactly. and. Exactly. That in and of itself is some of the biggest support that I give clients is saying, yeah, this is normal. And here's how we can change it if, if you want to change it right. without breaking your dog. Right. But it's also okay if you have a dog that does this because that's what they were bred specifically to yes. do. Yes, yes. Um, so what a relief for people to hear that from you. Right. I mean, and that's a lot goodness, of time what they changes need. A lot. Yeah, permission, right? Permission to allow that to happen and be okay with it. That's wonderful. And it changes how they work with them. Once you understand that, 
oh, okay, this is what corgis do. Right. You are no longer looking at it. You don't, instead of putting a construct on your dog by saying, well, he's aggressive or he's trying to be dominant or he's trying to put these right. labels on this dog, which changes how you end up interacting with the dog. If mm-hmm. you instead pull back and start looking at, well, this is what he was bred to do. This is part of his personality and all of that. You, you're a lot more open to working with him in a more humane way rather than labeling him. And so by, by understanding your dog more, you, the way that you train is a lot more, um, progressive and easier to work through. Right. Right. Wonderful. I can see why you're the top of your game. (laughs) (laughs) You made, you made me feel better already about the barking that's even going on now as we speak. Oh, I love it. It's (laughs) like white noise. He's just looking at me barking. (laughs) Yeah. I don't blame him. Somebody give him some cheese. Yeah, right. Exactly. Bud's over here feeding him cookies on the side. Yeah. (laughs) Well, it's so funny because, you know, I'm doing these Zoom online classes right now and, you know, Joker is like perfect when I demo with her and then I sit down and I'm looking at the screen and she's literally like chewing on my leg and nobody can see it, you know, right. but I'm thinking to myself, Jesus, if somebody looks, if someone were able to see right now, she, and then she's like making my leg bleed and I'm still yeah. trying to talk people through, <laughs> through stuff. So trust me, we've all been there. Oh my goodness. So tell me about the dogs that you have now. Oh, you have you such a variety. Yes, I, I love do. It. I, love I do. It. So we have, um, you know, I'll start with, I'll just go down the line in yeah, terms of age. Sure, uh, sure. I mean, my, I have a 13 and a half year old pit bull named Sergeant Pepper. We call him Sarge. He was abandoned at a shelter at 13 and a half. We got oh, him in November oh. um, because they were moving and they just didn't want him anymore. And yeah. um, I am a huge advocate for rescuing seniors, so yes. I always have at least one senior dog in my home. And um, Thank you for that. I had just Thank lost you. Prudence, my other senior, mm-hmm. and so we brought him in. So we have Sarge, who's 13 and a half. Then I have um, Paddington. He Aww. is my seven-year-old rough collie, and yes. he so is special. my – no, he's a very special dog. He's my demo dog. He's now retired, but he's a – He's a demo dog extraordinaire in terms of his work with children, his work with aggressive dogs. He does a, or did a lot of my reactivity work. Um, and he's just, he picks up on everything. He's wonderful. Um, then I have my two Papillons, Mallory and Mesner. Mm-hmm. Um, they're basically glorified cats that bark at everything. But um, Mallory is going to be five and Mesner is three. And they are – Mallory is a distant relative to Merlin. She's from the same oh. breeder that Merlin was from. And um, she is wonderful. She's actually Jake's favorite, my giant yeah. – um, you know, mountaineering husband right. has this three pound best friend. <laughs> I love it. Um, and then Mesner. Mesner's wonderful. He is um, – he's – always been very intuitive. The only reason I don't use him as much for a demo dog as I would love to is he's a small white dog. And what I found, even when I had Merlin, was one of the reasons I got Paddington was I would bring Merlin out into the middle or Mesner into the middle of classes and dogs would just look at them like he was a snack. Oh. Um, so I bring Mesner to do demo work or tricks work and stuff like okay. that at like, um, elder, like at hospice homes and that kind of sure. stuff. But I don't like bringing him into classes or reactive work because it just, it's too much yeah. for the dog sometimes. Yeah. So then I have, those are, um, then I have Rupert. Yes. Um, Rupert is my uh, nearly two-year-old rough collie. Pred- you know, he's going to be the prodigy to Paddington. He does all of Paddington's work for him now. And he is just the sweetest, sweetest boy. Um, and then I have Legend who is 11 months old, my Scottish deerhound, which you have my, to meet, Kim. I do you're... have to meet him. I look at the pictures that you post and I'm like, oh my God, and he grows so fast. Oh, he's How stunning. How big will he be when he's done he'll, growing? He'll be over 100 pounds, um, but they're, they're, they're not like Irish wolfhounds in their bulkiness. They're right, they're a little Scottish, bit lanky, no? They're, they're like hairy, giant greyhounds. That's okay. the only yeah. way that I can explain it. Yeah, that's it. But good. They, that's good. Yeah, that's they're good so docile. He's so uh, he looks sweet, so sweet natured. Yeah. And the reason that, um, and so legend and Rupert are my demo dog pair. So mm-hmm. the reason that legend is with me is I really wanted a larger dog to use for some of my aggression rehabilitation that was 
was very docile and easygoing, spoke dog well, but was large enough where I wouldn't be as worried as I would with like the collies. And what it's really nice for, for Legend and Rupert is they have each other. So when I'm doing some work with dogs on reactivity or social skills, yes. the pressure isn't always on just Rupert. Sure. I have yes. Legend and Rupert to balance it out, which That's is great. Really nice. And they are the best of friends. They really need their own little leather jackets. They're a <laughs> adolescent. Gang. <laughs> yes. Of like, what can we shred today? Oh, boy. And then last but not least, I have Joker. Um, yeah. And Joker is a foster failure. She was a um, cattle dog puppy born in the shelter. Um, That's so sweet. And... Uh, she was sitting in the shelter and the, the rescue was doing everything they could to really screen adopters. And she was left, she was the one of the only ones left with her sister. And uh, Melissa from the rescue reached out to me and said, you know, can we, can we put these puppies in one of your puppy classes for some socialization? And I said, absolutely, you know, bring them, get right. them out and get them some socializing while we wait for their home. And this little dog walked in and Kim, it was like, <laughs> that dog is mine. That um, face. Oh yes. my God. And that that was little it. mask that was on that face. Yes, yes. Of course. I can see why. I yeah. can see why. And she's extremely talented. I mean, she is my fun dog for me. You know, I okay, spend a right. lot of time doing aggression work and reactivity work and right. using and legend so and Rupert. Need- Yes. I need a dog for me. Yes, yeah. exactly, exactly. And I know your girls love the animals. Your Gracie has, you know, does she still have her bird? Oh, yeah, she, yeah, Echo. She, yeah. Yes. And so she loves them too. And you've just got such a gorgeous and beautiful family. And I think everybody, you know, would agree and say thank you for all that you do. Um, Helen, thanks for being on today. So this is a point where we ask about your snout out. Who is that today? That is the Pope Memorial SPCA in yes, Concord. Yes, yes. They are wonderful. Helen, how do you work with them? Um, I work with the Pope Memorial SPCA uh, very, very closely. I'm basically an honorary staff member at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm there every Wednesday doing um, evaluations for their dogs, and okay. I help train the volunteers on proper bot dog handling and all of that stuff. And then I do... Um, uh, staff trainings there. I do, I mean, pretty much anything and everything I can with the SPCA I do. And I think that they, uh, do a really phenomenal job in not just the care of their animals, but the care of the staff, um, their level of responsibility in terms of, um, to making sure that the dogs go to the right homes, but their um, accountability and taking dogs back when it's not the right fit. They're just a really phenomenal organization, and I'm really proud to be a part of it. Yes, I, you know, and I agree. Um, Bud and I have been there several times and worked with them. Um, and, you know, besides all the work that they do for all types of animals, like you said, their employees and the connection that they have um, with each other is quite something to see. They really are such a wonderful group of people. And, you know, there's, it's, it, they're just easy to work with. Right. And that's they're what very I love kind. so much about all of them. They are very kind human beings. Um, and it's really, it's really refreshing to see that. And what's <laughs> nice, uh, just from an outside perspective too, mm-hmm. as a trainer is, if I go to them and I say, hey, this is what I think this dog might need, or this is what I think we should change in our programs, or this kind of thing, they are completely 100% open to modifying and changing and being, you know, more forward thinking. And that that is a rare, um, that is a rare thing in, in right. a lot of business places and a lot of, right. you know, right. um, things today. So I think that they really deserve every every ounce of recognition that they get. Yes, yes. We will certainly have their information in the show notes. And Helen, how can people find you? We'll have your information in the show notes as well. But why don't you tell us how they can reach you? Um, well, if anybody's ever interested in checking stuff out, they can go to my website. It's no monkey business dog training.com. I'm mm-hmm. also on Facebook, no monkey business dog training, just on Facebook. You can find me there. Um, you know, I, my phone is attached. It's like a body part at all right. times. So it's, it's on me <laughs> everywhere. Um, they can always email or call, um, you know, and, uh, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody has anything with their dog going on, especially while we're stuck at home. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Helen, thank you again. This has been wonderful. We could talk a million times over. I know. So maybe know. we'll have you back someday. I'd love to. <laughs> Thanks, Helen. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. 
Thanks for listening to this episode of the Dog Storytime Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please take a minute to leave a review. And don't forget to subscribe so you won't miss all the exciting episodes we have coming up soon. If you want to learn more about our podcast and Kimberly's work with dogs, head over to KimberlySarahPhotography.com. Thank you for listening. Thank you.